Thanks very much. Thank you for the introduction as well. As, um, many thanks for inviting me to have the opportunity to talk about European citizenship at Fudan University. Um, some of my re reflections on European citizenship derives from a large project we did between 2009 and 2013 under a European Research Council uh, a funded project enacting European citizenship. As you all know, European citizenship is a very hot and contested topic in <laughs> Europe, but it has become even more so during the crisis, economic crisis. So I'm going to say a few words later on, what is the relationship between crisis, crisis of legitimacy, crisis of finance, and European citizenship. But before we do that, uh, let me just say something about the um, subtitle of the work, How Does It Not Work? It, it is a nudge-nudge um, uh, and blink-blink to the idea that the European, citizen, European citizenship does work to a certain limit, uh, but also it is dysfunctional. And it is in that space between its function and dysfunctionality there are some possibilities lie. There are some, uh, and much of the contestation actually takes place between the, 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 how it functions and how it fails to function. So it would be uh, good to have a broad uh, background on how European citizenship came to be. In fact, even in the title, I should have put European citizenship in quotation marks because, as I will uh, explain, European citizenship is not what it seems to indicate. It is much more complicated than having a, a just citizenship of a given membership. Definitely, standard definitions of um, citizenship does not apply to the idea of European citizenship. If we use the standard mainstream definition of citizenship as membership in a political community, uh, it doesn't apply to European citizenship in many complex ways. Uh, first of all, one cannot be a member of European citizenship unless one is already a member of a, um, a nationalized state within Europe. So unless you're French, you cannot be European. If you're a non-European, you cannot make claims to European citizenship. So that membership in political uh, community already uh, breaks down. Uh, still, it's also important to think in terms of the originality of European citizenship. When we compare European citizenship, a European-wide idea of citizenship, whether it is membership or belonging, um, there are certain originalities of, of this conception that needs to be marked, but not by what they are, rather than immediately naming them, what they are not, and leaving the space empty for signifying perhaps later. Often what happens is scholars are very anxious to signify because of the political battles around what European citizenship should be like, uh, and they actually um, take positions. For example, some people say uh, European citizenship is a supranational citizenship that supersedes the nationality uh, mode of belonging, and provides another level of belonging. It doesn't quite work that way, uh, because as I already mentioned, for it to have supranational uh, effectiveness, it has to have uh, the ability to admit and exclude members mm -hmm. uh, by its own powers, and it doesn't have them. Uh, so in that sense, it's not a supranational superseding mm -hmm. um, member state uh, or state citizenship. Um, and yet, it's not federal either. Federated in the sense, for example, the United States Constitution works as a federal state, German Constitution works as a federal state, meaning a hierarchical relationship between different levels of government, which is sorted in a constitution. Uh, Canadian Constitution is also a federal uh, state. The European Union does not have that, but has elements of it. So you have this... Um, Constantation, whether European citizenship and the Europe is supranational or federal, and then there are those, well, neither, but then there are suggested names, but really none of which exactly uh, work. That means already that there is something original 
in European citizenship. Uh, so it is good to mark that. <coughs> Originality doesn't mean better or worse, but it has the mixed elements of something different and new, and it's good to mark that. So supranational federal is one axis of discussion. The other one is, is it an imperial or national kind of citizenship? Imperial citizenship like tributary states uh, that become member of a broader rule, and they, by virtue of taxation or... Um, uh, tribute uh, benefit from being a member of a broader category or being ruled from center, but then uh, that subservience brings with it certain protections such as security, safety, uh, and border protection. Well, um, European citizenship clearly not imperial in that sense, but it has elements of imperial rule, and that has to be marked. And we need to um, talk about that a little bit later. Um, is it national kind of citizenship? Now, of course, many people who think about European citizenship and are in the process, process of contestation about its nature would say European citizenship is anything but national. It is not national. It, this is what it's trying to supersede. And yet, at the same time, by virtue of inertia or by virtue of explicit politics, it is also developing nation-like qualities by number of people who are uh, forcing it along those lines. But uh, what I mean by that is, for example, the entire debate about um, adoption of a national um, European flag. Why does Europe need to have a flag which is one of the most significant and potent symbols of, of nation? And then the other one is to have a national anthem uh, many people were opposed to Europe having a national anthem, not to mention that Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, a, an artwork was chosen or, or um, um, appropriated as a national anthem. So imperial or national is not also clear-cut. Um, it has elements of both, and yet it stands somewhere in between. And it, in between that space, there are some possibilities. It can go in various directions. So that's the other originality, if you like. Um, the third dimension of its originality is we don't know whether it's democratic or authoritarian. Um, its credentials are democratic. It wants to be a democratic European um, uh, parliament, directly elected parliament, um, and yet European Commission has powers under certain circumstances that many member state governments do not have. Um, we've seen that very clearly during the austerity crisis and certain measures imposed on Greece, Spain, and Italy uh, in terms of um, their economic and fiscal policy. And in the way in which those policies were introduced, many people have identified certain authoritarian tendencies, authoritarian not in the sense of the substance of the decisions only, but also the formal procedures. In Italy, the European Union almost um, enacted a, a coup by other means, mm -hmm. by replacing a, a one regime with another. Um, and then there are the elements of um, direct rule, as it were. And in terms of democratic issues, there's a long-running debate in Europe about the democratic deficit. To an extent, uh, with the beginning of the direct European Parliament elections, that's been said that it's been... Um, it's been better, but still there are, there are questions of democratic legitimacy of rule in Europe and to what extent those decisions um, represent a popular will of European people. Um, so that's the other axis of its originality, that it is neither, it has the elements, then what is it, which is, opens up all the debates. And finally, the fourth axis of its originality is, is from the perspective of law. Now, since two, uh, 1992, coming into effect in 1993 of Maastricht Treaty, mm -hmm. it is said that European Union is now constitutional because from customary law it moved into explicit treaty, treaty which was submitted to various member states' popular um, uh, ratification, but not all. Only those states that opted for that option actually ratified something like a constitution. So it's said that Lisbon uh, uh, Treaty, for
for all intents and purposes, is constitutional. And yet, in that constitutional format, in that constitutional form, it has developed um, customary law uh, that sometimes works along with, sometimes against the constitutional law, and it is debated and discussed. And the significant agent of that is European Court of Justice. Uh, many scholars in citizenship law agree today. I would say that it's probably emerging consensus, if not mainstream, at least emerging consensus among European legal scholars is that European Court of Justice has become an active agent of developing a European, distinctly European notion of citizenship through customary case law. In other words, by looking at cases uh, one by one and rendering judgment that sometimes goes against uh, the principles of the, of the treaty, definitely goes against the will of number of member states and creates a friction between member states and the uh, European Union. So then whether it is constitutional or customary is also up in the air. It has elements of both and it opens up space for contestation such as um, the, the um, European Court of Justice. But in a few minutes, I'm going to even complicate that matter further. But for now, just now, um, mark these four as the elements of originality of European citizenship. How these elements came together. Now, I'm going to apologize for this long list. I know that in a PowerPoint presentation, it's too much to uh, absorb and digest, but I needed to put of them. But um, I have grade out the ones that I'm not going to focus on, but few um, benchmarks along the way since 1945 that's been significant in the articulation of a European citizenship. You will also note that this is the first time now I put European in quotation marks, mm -hmm. because now what I'm really looking at is the evolution of the European Union citizenship. And I'm going to differentiate European Union citizenship from European citizenship. Now that, in European legal scholarship and European political theory, is definitely a minority view. Mm -hmm. It may be even minority of one. Mm -hmm. It has not like, gained traction to make, a distinct, to make a distinction between European citizenship and European Union citizenship. These are two different things. European Union politics benefits immensely from the fact that they are confused, that two different things are conflated. I will explain in, in few minutes what these distinctions are. But be that as it may, what we are looking at here is the origins of European Union citizenship, though still I would like to use European citizenship in quotation marks, <laughs> without giving also primacy the EU moniker. So obviously, um, one thing to note here, the broad um, lesson I want to draw, is that European Union and the very idea of citizenship has multiple sources. Mm -hmm. Any interpretation that tries to uh, uh, put forward a singularized, homogeneous understanding of EU citizenship is misguided. There are a number of scholars, for example, will say, in its origins, European Union citizenship was political. Mm -hmm. Following 1944, 1945, and the atrocity of war, it was a response to that. Mm -hmm. That's only partially the case. Some people say that it was purely economic. The political economy of the time dictated, in fact, Marshall Plan that a European uh, market be introduced to homogenize the effects of the Marshall Plan. So in other words, if you like, an American capital instigated uh, European market was in fact one of the origins. That's only partially true. Some say that there has been a long, long tradition of desiring to constitute a European identity, a European, a cultural notion. And then they cite, even going all the way back to Greeks, there's so many literature about this, a long continuous march toward cultural idea of Europe that 1945 was the moment to seize, only partially true. None of this can actually subsume the multiple origins of coming into being of U EU citizenship. Each played a part, but there were certain personalities, certain events, certain developments that came together in different moments 
the articulated, and by no means in a teleological way. In other words, knowing where it was going. It was mixed, multiple and partial development. Each way, it's contested. And I will illustrate that with one example later on, how European citizenship could have looked very differently if negotiations led to Maastricht Treaty had accepted a principle, for example. We would have been living in a different world. But that principle in the 11th hour was rejected. And I will come back to that. So it's a very contingent history we are looking at, not necessary. There is nothing necessary in it. Contingent and multiple sources. Obviously, in 1951, Treaty of Paris tried to create a coal and steel community with that moniker, but really trying to respond to Marshall Plan and a European economic market and understanding the European economic market. Um, accession of Denmark and Ireland and the UK was really crucial into that market, which was also a crucial um, uh, condition for, um, for conceiving a market that was broader than just a, a few uh, states. And then in 1986, really that single European act, meaning accession of Portugal and Spain, uh, becomes the, uh, the European market uh, proper, and yet at the same time, flag is adopted. When you look at, the, on the one hand, this marketization process, creating a market, um, and yet on the other hand, a culturalization of that market with adopting a, a flag. Um, when you look at the specific debates leading to the adoption of flag, you would get the impression that, in fact, it has no connection whatsoever that it is about single European act producing a market. It has no reference to market, the flag debates. It, it's culturalized. On the other hand, the debates to, in favor of a single market makes no mention of its culturalization, adoption of flag. So these multiple things are playing themselves out with playing different uh, agents. But the result is the adoption of the Single European Act. That was in 1986. And in 1992, obviously, um, that was a, a crucial turning point, as I mentioned. Uh, first of all, the European Union as such was born. Mm -hmm. And European Union was born as, um, as, as the a result of a constitution. Um, although it's not called that, Maastricht Treaty, but for all intents and purposes, legally, it's the constitution that gives expression to European uh, Union. And then in 1995, the accession of Austria, Finland, Sweden were significant um, aspects of the European Union. And at that time, it became uh, clear that 17-member um, European Union would be the core of the European um, citizenship or EU citizenship. But of course, 1989 and the revolutions in 1989 made itself really felt very strongly. And then it was already debated that it was a moment of opportunity of including Eastern Europe in, in Europe. So then during that discussion that France and Netherlands actually rejected the original drafts of uh, what became the Lisbon Treaty. Um, and yet, uh, Lisbon Treaty was finally uh, ratified, accepted, and the accession of Bulgaria and Romania with much acrimony and with much uh, difficulty uh, uh, came into being in 2007. Now, this is the European Union, and on paper now, in 2013, we have 27 members of, of uh, the Union, and these 27 members are all equal. Mm -hmm. That's what constitutions say about uh, the idea of citizenship, if it is to be accepted. All equal, equally treated, and uh, the rule of law pertains. Well, we will see that it doesn't. And in that sense, that constitution remains in conflict with development of customer law and remains as something that is in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in progress. I just want to read one thing um, about the Maastricht Treaty, the citizenship rights. What articulate Maastricht Treaty is considered also coming into being of not only the European Union, but European idea of citizenship proper. That's when we can talk about European Union citizenship. What is it that it introduced in terms of rights for 
uh, citizens that one can say this is European Union citizenship. Um, three of them, the additional uh, rights, are really significant. One is it introduced electoral rights in a member state of residence in municipal and European Parliament elections. So if you're actually a member of an, a member state and you're residing other than your member state, to make it concrete, you're a Spanish citizen, you're residing in the UK, you have the right to vote in UK local elections, in borough elections. So that means you are a political franchise holder, locally speaking, local government, but not at the national level. So you cannot say whether Cameron is going to be your uh, prime minister or not, but you can say whether Boris Johnson is going to be your mayor or not, is the difference between the two. Second one, consular and diplomatic protection offered to EU citizens when traveling abroad. Um, and then non-judicial means of redress, such as the right to petition the European Parliament and apply to the Ombudsman. These were additional rights to one cardinal right of European citizenship, that is free movement. This is the most significant aspect of European citizenship. Free movement, that means considered as a labor right in 27 countries, theoretically, I will come to that, practically it doesn't exist, or at least in that form, but theoretically, in 27 countries, a labor right of freedom of movement exists. Any member of the member state can take up employment in any other. So when we think about in terms of our, for example, project, um, six appointed research uh, uh, researchers, research fellows, mm -hmm. one of them is actually um, a British citizen, mm -hmm. but five of them are non-British citizens. And four of those are using their European rights to be employed by the project with no questions asked. Um, but in practice, it works very differently. But at least that right is being exercised. That right didn't exist before Maastricht Treaty. It would have been subject to series of other nationality rules and so on. Now, there is one more complication in 2013 in the European citizenship, is that in 2013, as we speak, I cannot elaborate on this during my talk today, but during the discussions, if you bring it up, I will elaborate it in length. But it is something very significant that's happening. That is, in 2013, the Council of Europe, which is something different, I'll tell you in a minute, to complicate the idea of uh, European citizenship, and the European Commission reached an agreement to include the EU as a community into the convention, European Convention of Human Rights. So European Convention of Human Rights is a convention signed and ratified by various European states. They are states. If this agreement is ratified, it will be the first non-state member of the convention, which generates incredible customary law issues, if not constitutional. And the lawyers and the constitutional um, experts have not yet sorted out the complications, and yet the EU has submitted an application and in agreement now uh, to include it. This is a very interesting new development. Now, you might just sit back and say, oh my God, I have, I'm already confused. There are <laughs> many acronyms mentioned, many categories, different polities. Can you tell us, please, what is called European citizenship? <laughs> Sorry, I can't. It's not in, in, a, in a flat, singular way can be answered. But at least we can look at five dimensions of European citizenship, and in each dimension actually complicate it, and get a better idea of how it does not work, but I cannot really give a definition. And by that uh, uh, extension, I should also say that one should be very careful about anyone who claims to define it. So, this is at least one thing you can carry away. Take away, uh, what's the term? Uh, take away lesson or take home lesson? One, one if you want to stay with anyone who claims to know what European citizenship is, you can always counter that, but 
because it cannot be defined. It is that complicated. The question is that it's so layered and dimensioned. In the economic sphere, European citizenship possibly is the one that is identified with the labor right of free movement. That could be the defining element. But the problem is, it applies to only 27 countries out of some 50 plus in Europe. So it's actually a minority of member states. So it cannot really claim the title of European. It can claim European Union, but mm -hmm. 27 countries. Even to further complicate, within those 27 countries, that freedom of movement is actually restricted. So for example, if you're a Bulgarian citizen, you don't experience that European citizenship the same way. There are restrictions. If you're going to UK or Germany, it's restricted. You cannot take up employment. If you are Romanian citizen, if you go to Germany, UK or um, uh, Sweden, you cannot take up employment. European Commission is not happy about that. There's constant um, debate, but member states do everything they can within their, um, within their powers to actually complicate the free movement. As a result, movement is anything but free. It's striated and, and layered movement. One has to accept that. The, the, the effective reality of European citizenship today Freedom, um, movement is not free. That's important. So within that, there is some movement, and one has to uh, understand that. In the second dimension is the political reach of the idea of European, uh, European political identity. Now, that political reach is also limited and strided. Yes, there is a directly... Uh, elected parliament, but parliament has very limited and limiting powers. It by no means compares to a legislative um, assembly of any given member state. It doesn't have what might one call in the con in constitution law it, a co um, sovereignty of a legislative as assembly. It doesn't have that. It has to. Uh, it has a very restricted sphere in the amount of decisions or the range of decisions it can make and then those decisions have to be also negotiated with the two other parties of the European Union uh, Council and the Council of Ministers, uh, Commission and the Council of Ministers. So the three of them are also in constant struggle with one another and yet um, direct election to Parliament is a very limited reach, and that's why people talk about democratic deficit. Um, one cannot say that on matters that concern the broader issues of European Union are rarely up for uh, electoral, um, electoral decision-making in the sense in which it is possible in traditional classical representative democracies, uh, democracies of member states. That's why people talk about there is democratic deficit in the European Union. But even if that was not the case, again, from my point of view, being intent on making that difference between European Union and European broader sphere, European space of politics, one has to also call into question a 27-member um, entity actually speaking for 50-plus continental Europe, um, I shouldn't even say continental, Europe. Um, that, there is that issue that uh, stands. In terms of its social effects, it's very patchy and fragmented. Is there a social Europe? The short answer is no. There is no social Europe. Um, and yet there are elements of it. There is some elements of social Europe. And yet member states do everything in their power to even restrict that uh, social Europe to narrower uh, means. Social Europe is very much a, a work in progress. Um, its geographic area, I'm going to switch to that in, in a minute, it's very fluid and yet bounding. Uh, its geographic area is constantly contested. Uh, European Union sometimes puts itself in the position of being police of Europe. It has a very significant um, Frontier Agency, uh, Frontex, 
tries to police the borders of Europe, mm -hmm. tries, bends, bends over, uh, what's the term, bends over backward, bend backward mm -hmm. over, anyway, I mix my metaphors always, but <laughs> it goes out its way to demonstrate the member states that it can actually protect boundaries better than they can. Mm -hmm. In other words, we can be better policed, and so it plays the security politics mm -hmm. and trying to legitimate, and then as a result, it on the one hand, restricts what it means to be European because it is about 27 states, and yet at the same time, as I was saying earlier, it develops imperial tendencies. So you will encounter, for example, frontiers of Europe in Turkey in the, in the, in the, in the form of Frontex, Frontex and its officers. You will see it in Northern, Northern Africa, also in the form of um, Frontex, you will see it in uh, Northern Europe, mm -hmm. also in the form of uh, Frontex. So frontiers are expanding and shrinking simultaneously, constantly and fluidly depend, uh, defining what is outside and what is inside uh, Europe. So it plays that geographic uh, politics. And its legal scope is intensively multiple and entangled, and I want to just say um, a few things about that now. Now, when I say Europe, of course, you have already given this, uh, you have already had the sense that I made one distinction. Let's talk about um, European Union that became to be 27 members, and let's remember that there is, outside, there is Europe outside European Union. There is both historically and geographically, there is a Europe beyond mm -hmm. European Union. Now, let's take a look at that. There's Eurozone which many of the financial decisions by European uh, Central Bank mm -hmm. that uh, is effective, its members are 17 states. There was a very interesting moment a few years ago when uh, British Prime Minister vetoed a, a decision which was effectively ineffective, null, and void right from the outset, which concerned a decision about a tighter integration of Eurozone's fiscal policy. Why it was ineffective uh, uh, de facto was because uh, UK is not a member of Eurozone. Why it was symbolically significant? Because it had the effect of Euro, uh, a one member state or prime minister of the United Kingdom standing against Europe, which is a significant political ploy um, to bolster one's uh, chances at home electoral uh, success. So member states constantly keep playing uh, that, that role. So which Europe are we talking about? Eurozone, for example, much of the crisis debate and discussion um, effectively is about 17 states. And what the European Central Bank and European Commission decide about the distribution of wealth and income amongst those 17 states, but not 27. And then we have an area called Schengen area, which is a significant, at the same time, challenge to free movement. It's an agreement, multilateral agreement reached amongst 26 states that they decide the movement of people amongst themselves, regardless or parallel to the European Union, which creates, of course, uh, incredible um, complexities in everyday lives of European citizens. It is almost schizophrenic to uh, travel from London to Copenhagen to Oslo to Stockholm and back to Paris. You would be traversing various Europes. Even in that short distance, you would be definitely traversing Eurozone, you would be traversing Schengen area, you would be traversing European Union, but not enough. You're also traversing Council of Europe. Now, Council of Europe has a different history from the European Union. It has 47 states. Those 47 states are bound by ratification to the European Convention of Human Rights. By all intents and purposes, European Convention of Human Rights developed very significant qualities of being European Convention of Citizenship Rights. I don't have time to enter into that today. I already mentioned it, but if I were to have time to devote, that would be a, uh, an entire seminar by itself. And it would be about how the European Convention of Human Rights 
has now developed European citizenship-like qualities. So in other words, today, significantly, there is an argument to be made that there is an incipient and developing European citizenship independent of and sometimes against the European Union citizenship of whose members are 47. And hence the significance of EU wanting to be member of this club. So EU wants to be the 48th member. You see what I mean? How complicating it will be? We could spend all day talking about the constitutional and legal difficulties of that. And yet it, it is happening now. At least agreement has reached. So Council of Europe, through Convention of Human Rights, develops citizenship-like qualities. So um, in the large project we did, for example, Kurdish citizens in Turkey mm -hmm. make claims to European citizenship under the Convention of Human Rights, regardless and independent of the European Union. And they call themselves European citizens. And Turkish state treats them accordingly, meaning either violence or accepting, depending on the circumstances. As though that's not enough, there is a 57-state Europe. That's Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which also sometimes works against, sometimes along with Frontex. It's a security organization and deals with various... But as you know, in the last 10 years, security has expanded immensely what it means, security. So it undertakes issues, for example, in Latvia, Estonia, and Ukraine. It undertakes... Um, um, assessment of constitutional, uh, constitutional um, progress with regard to issues of citizenship. It does assessment exercises in other states, uh, looks at the development of citizenship uh, in those jurisdictions. So OSCE developed also qualities that police citizenship in 57 states, but of course only a, a minority of them. So it is an imperial rule. A core states determine the agenda, and other states are in, on the receiving end of all these assessments and so on. So very interesting uh, politics developed over the last 50 years over OSC. Not to mention, of course, NATO with 28 states, which polices the military security, but also engages in other... Um, just a case in point, for example, Libya um, bombing was a war by all other means, as it were, in a constitutional speaking. It, had, it was called NATO, but it, it had the ratification of the European Union. It had the uh, American involvement through uh, NATO. OSCE was involved. Member states was involved. Very complicated war was waged really against Libya for whatever the humanitarian intervention that, that's called, but it did not really have the same level of debate, for example, as Iraq and Afghanistan. So in other words, legally, even declaring and engaging in wars is getting complicated. Again, which Europe, whose Europe, in whose name, these decisions are very murky. Yet one more recent example is um, French involvement in um, uh, Mali. Um, very complicated legally in the name of European Union, but independently having made that decision because of its particular colonial history as a member state. And European Commission, as a body, chose to stay outside. <laughs> What's that mean? Um, these new legal maneuvers need to be um, constantly questioned with which Europe, in whose name, uh, these uh, decisions are being made. Now, this is how I would visualize Europe today. I really mean it. This is how I would visualize it. Empty. Wow. <laughs> there is no map, no diagram I'm capable of that I can show you. Believe me, I tried. Uh, but every time, it failed. It's impossible to capture within my skills to really, and I desperately am looking for a, a, a expert in visualizing Europe who would have uh, diagram, diagrammatic skills, but also conceptual skills to be able to, 
at least bring some of this complexity to, to bear. But one thing that I was definitely against to do is to show you maps of nation states. It is so misleading, these contiguous nation states, geographically represented as though it is the representation of reality. Today, the negotiations and the legal maneuvering that is taking place that appropriates that word Europe is so much more complicated than any map representation actually succeed. So my decision as a scholar at this point in time, it is perhaps best to represent blank until we have better visual means, but definitely not fall into the trap of representing nations in different colors. In each of those, uh, 27, 17, 47, 57, all those, I could have shown you maps. In fact, each of those bodies have fancy maps to demonstrate that they embrace Europe. They do different projections, Mercator projection, this projection, that projection, coloring, and so on. In each one of them, when you look at it, ah, I'm in Europe. But of course, these are all contested representations of, and each of them is partial and limited. Um, we don't have yet the means to visualize uh, Europe, and I don't know how it can be done. Um, I have some conceptual tools. It needs to be done topologically. It would have to conform different geometric principles, and it would probably have to use different prints, uh, uh, kind of data, uh, perhaps transactional data. But I have sought far and wide to find uh, adequate visualizations of Europe in academic literature as well as commercial literature, because commercially, People are very interested. If I had time, I would have shown you um, a recent representation of flight data. And someone did mm -hmm. uh, those matters. Now, all of these um, struggles over Europe and the definition of European citizenship by various actors have been taking place since 1949 at a minimum. However, these came to... Um, a, a real clash amongst them and therefore the liminal spaces that opened um, widened uh, over the last five years. The contemporary crisis of Europe is uh, simultaneous to over financial capital which instigated it but it is not limited to it uh, and when I say financial capital this is not just in terms of particularly one dominant class uh, let's say, financial uh, class uh, trying to articulate its interest, but even the fractions of within financial, uh, financial capital and what those fractions are trying to uh, achieve. G to give you an example how complicated it is within financial capital, as we speak, a massive battle going on between Frankfurt and London to become the next uh, financial center of Europe. London enjoyed... Uh, uninhibited monopoly of dominating financial transactions in Europe at least for about 12 years at a minimum uh, since 1997 particularly but even longer than that. Um, during the crisis partially it lost that uh, because of the crisis uh, in the banking sector but also now the European Central Bank and the European Commission are holding Frankfurt as the um, negotiation bait, as it were, with the UK, whether the UK should remain within the EU or not. And so Frankfurt is being positioned by France and Germany as the next financial center. This is just one example amongst many, not to mention how, for example, financial crisis was handled in Spain, Italy, and Greece, as I also mentioned, and the differential treatment of various different citizens in Europe mm -hmm. with respect to European Central Bank's decisions and the European Union's decisions. It's a very complicated terrain of struggle taking place. The other dimension of the crisis is the crisis of legitimacy. The European Union is, to put in, another, uh, in a nutshell, desperate desperate to regain legitimacy. Only a few years ago, um, 
amongst intellectuals, uh, European Union uh, was veritably the intellectual horizon with which everyone agreed. Today it's broken, and it's a good thing that it is broken. Um, but at the same time, there is considerable um, uh, a crisis or struggle over legitimacy over the European Union, given the complexity that I have just given you a picture of, uh, involvement of various different states, uh, polities, and, and entanglement of different interests over Europe. And then there is the question of struggle over identity. Um, the, whether culturally defined, economically described, um, financially instituted, the idea of Europe, however limited it is, was meant to instigate at least a European identity. European identity that is distinct and beyond specific national identities in Europe. One of the master narratives in Europe for decades has been European Union represents hope. Mm -hmm. Hope against member states and nationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we know what, for example, German nationalism did. We know what French nationalism did. We know what British or English nationalism is capable of. We know that what nationalism can show, uh, and we don't want to go back to that Europe, has been the master narrative. But the way in which politics unfolded in the last five years has brought that master narrative under significant question, not only uh, on the left and by the left progressive movement, but also increasing um, populism, some of which takes um, nationalist tones. Um, and not necessarily in the best sense of that term, if there is one. From my point of view, there is no best sense of uh, a term that can be ascribed to any form of nationalism, but to accommodate those who think that there are better versions of nationalism, even that better versions are not the ones that are being enacted in, uh, in Europe in various forms of uh, populism. So there's a struggle over who takes uh, hold of the notion of Europeanness, is it possible to develop a European politics today? An alternative, uh, progressive, different kind of politics given the institutional complexity and um, the crisis over it? This is very much a question uh, mark in various forms of politics that's uh, unfolding in Europe, whether a movement around uh, uh, Occupy movement uh, occupying various squares and streets, uh, underlying the inequalities and the deep injustices that uh, underlie the European Central Bank's decisions about the redistribution of capital in the way in which banks have been bailed out, enormous amounts of uh, financial capital have been invested in uh, markets, despite the fact that many people have been um, shorn of their um, life savings, possibilities, jobs, despite the fact that unemployment has reached unprecedented levels, at least in Spain, but in other jurisdictions. Um, the, the way in which politics is unfolding in Europe is anyone's guess and which way it will go. Out of the ruins of that Europe, will there be a Europe with a hope of a progressive politics that underlines the... Uh, uh, structural inequalities that mark uh, the European project, or it is going to be re-legitimation of, uh, again, financial capital and powers that be is very much uh, out in the, uh, um, in the open. But th those are broader questions. More specifically, uh, I, want to, I want to underline two significant challenges and prospects of European citizenship. Two of them are uh, one is state sovereignty. Both of them revolve around the question of sovereignty. What is at stake in Europe today is sovereignty. But the outcomes of the struggle also will have global reverberations. It's not local to Europe. So when we are talking, and this is not in the sense of 19th century Europe, uh, 19th century and 20th century uh, 
imperial sense of Europe that it has universal reverberations. But what is at issue in Europe today is sovereignty. And that articulates itself in two forms. One, state sovereignty, and the other one is popular sovereignty. State sovereignty is challenged by three contradictory and complementary, in other words, paradoxical tendencies. On the one hand, the state is trying to um, privatize. And in many states, privatization reached such levels that what considered to be public services, by all intents and purposes, are delivered by private companies. And it is increasing the opening question in citizens' mind, if I am constantly provided for and encountering private capital and private money, private services, in public sense, with public name, what is exactly public? In other words, what is exactly British when I'm served by, let's say, uh, one of the international companies, can you give me, uh, that came into being during Iraq war, uh, the most infamous of privatized... Uh, in the US, you mean? Um, the other one, Blackwater, but now it's been replaced by, I forgot, there, there are several of them. Now they are very active in the European market as provider of public services, <laughs> right? From war to peace for them has been a very good transformation. They don't have a complaint about peace because it served them well. And if the war is going to serve them well again, they will jump ship. No problem. Wherever money to be made, they will follow. This privatization raises significant challenge to state sovereignty. It, it fragments in terms of um, sovereign decision making of, of public services. But privatization is only one part of that challenge. The other one is outsourcing. Outsourcing is different than privatization. To privatize, let's say, postal service to provide postal service with, let's say, user fees is one thing. Outsourcing hospitals to private companies to provide public service is entirely different. Outsourcing benefit assessment, which is also public service, it's a social citizenship, to a private company that will be guided by profit-making motive is a different ballgame it significantly raises massive question in the mind of the question, what am I dealing with? When am I dealing with the state? When you are dealing with private companies? And on the other hand, states are being partitioned. They are partitioned into various regions of outsourcing and privatization. Various companies are given different um, monopoly rights in different spaces in, in different countries. So the state's indivisible sovereignty, which is another master narrative that maintains the state, can no longer hold true if it ever did, but in actual experience of um, citizenship. The second one is popular sovereignty. The master narrative that citizenship represents the popular sovereignty, popular will of the people, and only in so far as it represents the popular will of the people that is worth calling it citizenship, as the undergirding idea of, of um, very idea of citizenship is very much fragmented in the context of not only European citizenship but member state citizenship today. It cannot hold. It cannot hold that uh, master narrative. Mm -hmm. um, popular sovereignty is not a narrative that can hold water, as it were, in the context of the European <coughs> Union. This is especially not only political citizenship, we have seen during the crisis, but in terms of social citizenship, it is so um, reduced, it is so evacuated of its effective uh, meaning, it is so evacuated from its effective rule the idea of social citizenship is not something that you can actually rally any progressive politics about. 
in its actual movement today in, in Europe, then if both political and social terms, a Europe cannot be imagined, and in fact member states discussions that the only way to provide social and political citizenship is to sever themselves from European various European projects, that severely challenges the project of European citizenship. In fact, it is it may be well at a breaking point at the moment. Uh, which direction it's going to go, it's not known. Um, and what will trigger it is also unknown. Uh, as you may know, the UK has embarked in, on a very dangerous politics already by its prime minister uh, promising an electoral promise that in 2017 it is going to put the uh, uh, secession from the European Union to the vote, a referendum, 2017. The, the genie is out of the bottle. I mean, once these kinds of things are done, you cannot undo them. You can't, a, 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 a promise is being made to the British electorate. If the British electorate now demands that promise, that promise be, be kept, a very dangerous game now open, and there are populist forces, there is incredible amount of money to be invested in yes or no, and in 2017, the UK may well be the battlefield of the future of Europe, and you don't know what will trigger. But even before then, another trigger may come along. We do not know. We are at that stage in Europe and European citizenship today. I know that I've taken almost full hour, but I wanted to articulate really fully um, the prospects and challenges of European citizenship. Thanks very much for your patience.